I'm not sure. Yeah, looks like recording's in progress, so maybe I'll get started. Um, yeah, so thanks for coming. Um, I guess what I want to talk about today is, uh, so the title is Hilbert Polynomials. Uh, for finite Terry matroids. And this is joint work with um, Anton Julia for Nasiero. Um, and I guess this joint work sort of uh, evolved out of us trying to uh, solve some specific problems, which are sort of more related to model theory. But I guess the results in a lot of the applications aren't very model theoretic at all. There's this sort of uh, common phenomena that comes up um, frequently in um, commutative algebra and uh, combinatorics of things which uh, sort of grow. And as they grow, they eventually look like a polynomial. So I'll start with some examples. Examples um, of eventual polynomial growth. Um, so the first one comes from additive combinatorics. Let A and B be uh, finite subsets. of a commutative semigroup S um, and then for T some natural number um, the set A plus T B is going to be the uh, the set of all elements in S of the form A plus B1 plus Bt, where A is in A and uh, B1 up through Bt are in B. So just the sort of usual sum set, you just take uh, things from A, um, T different things from B, add them all together and look at what you get. And so the uh, the big theorem which is due to uh, Gavonsky in, um, I think, 92, is that there is a, uh, there's a polynomial P, where the degree of P is less than um, the size of the set B such that um, the size of the set, the size of the sum set A plus TB um, is equal to P of T for 
all sufficiently large T. So when I write this, I mean that there's some T zero such that for all T bigger than T zero, the size of the set is given by this polynomial. So if you sort of think about these sets like living inside of a uh, commuted a semigroup, it's maybe like not so unbelievable that their size is maybe bounded by a polynomial or something like this, um, since the group is commutative. But it's like, uh, I guess, fairly remarkable that it actually is given by a polynomial from some point onward. Um, so that's the first sort of uh, um, occurrence of this phenomena. Um, Kavansky's proof of this goes back to the second occurrence, which is really sort of the, the fundamental occurrence, um, which is the Hilbert polynomial. So uh, I'll let K be a field. Um, I'll let R be the polynomial ring over K. in M variables. Um, and I'm going to always view this polynomial ring as a graded ring, and it's graded in the usual way. So the, uh, the graded parts just correspond to homogeneous polynomials of degree D. Um, and I'll let M be a finitely generated um, graded um, graded R module. So uh, examples of this would just be like, say, a homogeneous ideal. And this is, I think, one of the main applications is the homogeneous ideal corresponding to a, uh, um, or rather a graded ideal corresponding to a projective variety. Um, but yeah, graded, finally generated R module. And uh, the theorem, which is due to uh, Obert, is that, um, again, there is a polynomial T. Or a polynomial P um, with a degree of P. Um, less than m, the number of indeterminates, such that the uh, k linear dimension of mt is equal to p of t, for t sufficiently large. Um, right, I guess the, uh, the normal way that this is sort of proved is you uh, construct a power series um, it's a sum of uh, the dimension of m of t times x to the t. And then you prove that this is equal to a rational function of a very specific form. And from this, you can deduce um, this thing. And here, dim k is, I'm not sure if I said, just the k linear dimension. All of these graded parts are uh, k vector spaces, right? So that's the second example of this phenomenon. Um, and then the third example comes from uh, differential algebra. So let K be a field. Um, this time I'll ask that K is uh, characteristic zero. Um, a derivation on K. is a map um, delta from k to k um, such that, um, first of all, it should respect sums. Delta a plus b is delta a plus delta b. And uh, it should satisfy the Leibniz rule for products. Delta a b is equal to um, a delta b plus b delta A for A, B, and K. Um, right, so this is just like an algebraic object, but of course there are a lot of natural examples of this coming from analysis. Um, so now I'll let delta one up through delta M be commuting derivations.
on k. And then k with these derivations is usually called a uh, partial differential field. Um, and of course, there are like a lot of examples of this, like uh, power series and several variables where the derivations are just derivatives with respect to each of these variables, um, things like that. So uh, the theorem here due to Colton, let's see, what's the date, 1964. is that, um, so first let's let F be a um, partial differential subfield of K. So this is just going to be a subfield of K, which is closed under all of the derivatives. Um, a be a tuple from K. And then for T and T, or sorry, for T and N, let FT be just the field generated over F by um, everything of the form delta one to the R one through delta M to the R M A, where R one plus all the way through Rm is equal to T. Um, so this is not going to be a differential subfield in general. It's just a subfield, right? So all I'm doing is I'm taking this tuple A. I'm applying all of the partial differential operators to it. Um, but collectively, I'm applying them at most T times in total. Um, so then just like the previous results, then there is a polynomial. P, um, actually, sorry, this should be less than or equal to T here. And that'll be important a little bit later. But um, so I'm applying these at most T times, but perhaps less. So this, this field also includes A and the derivatives of A and so on. Um, so there's a polynomial P. Um, this time the degree of P is less than or equal to M such that the transcendence degree over F of FT is equal to P of T for T sufficiently large. Um, yeah, I guess Colchin's original proof of this didn't really use the, uh, the theorem on the Hilbert polynomial, but there was a later proof that showed that you can actually prove this using um, the Hilbert polynomial. Right, so I guess uh, we want to sort of give a framework that unifies these three examples. In all three of these examples, there are some similarities. Um, there's some sort of uh, dimension or rank. So in this case, it's just cardinality. Um, in that case, it's K linear dimension. And in that case, it's a transcendence degree. Um, there's also sort of a finite set in each one. So here it's the finite set A. Um, over there, it's the finite set of generators. And over here, um, it's just this finite tuple A. Um, and then there are some sort of operators that are acting on this finite set. So here we're acting on this set by adding elements of B. Um, over there, we're acting on this set by multiplying by these uh, indeterminates X1 through XM. And over here, of course, the operators are just our usual differential operators. Um, so this is all sort of vague, but I'll make this a little bit more concrete. Um, first of all, the sort of structure that's useful for uh, giving a sort of um, general account of these dimensions is uh, the structure coming from both uh, algebraic combinatorics and from model theory called a finitary matroid. Yeah. Uh, 
Um, sorry, I just mean um, delta applied to each element of the tuple. So this is going to be, you know, if A is equal to A1 through AN, this is all of these operators applied to some AI for any I equals one through N. Um, I guess maybe instead of thinking about this as a tuple, it would be better to think about this as a finite set of generators. And I'm applying these deltas at most T times to any element of the set, taking all of these things together and then generating a field with that. Does that make more sense? Um, yeah, I think it's just, this is the way that it's usually written when uh, doing this sort of thing. Um, yeah, so a finitary matroid, or I guess when it's used in model theory, it's generally called a pre-geometry. Um, is a set um, X with a closure operator CL. And CL here goes from the power set of X to the power set of X. So it takes subsets of X to subsets of X, um, satisfying the following properties. Um, so one, this is generally called uh, monotonicity, I guess. If A is a subset of B, then the closure of A, um, sorry, A is a subset of its own closure, and that's a subset of the closure of B. Um, Idempotence. Um, so this says that the closure of the closure of A is just equal to the closure of A um, for any subset A. Three is finite character. Um, so this says that if an element A is in the closure of a set B, um, then there is a finite set um, E0 subset of B with A in the closure of B0. So if you're in the closure of B, then this is witnessed by some finite subset of B. And then four is called exchange or Steinitz exchange. So this is that if uh, A is in the closure of our set B along with the new element B, but it's not in the closure of B, then uh, B is in the closure of A. Or sorry, B is in the closure of our set B union A. So this essentially says that um, if A is somehow dependent on B over this big set B, then B is also dependent on A. So you can sort of switch them out. Um, I guess uh, generally matroids, when people talk about them and say algebraic combinatorics are studied where X, in the case where X is finite, in which case the finite character thing is really sort of unnecessary. Um, but here I'm allowing X to be an infinite set. And this is sort of the, the more useful setting for doing model theory. Um, so this finite character axiom sort of like uh, still says that in some way this is controlled by finite sets. Um, Right, so uh, if X is a finitary matroid,
And all of these axioms, especially the last axiom, allow us to sort of uh, give a good definition of rank. Um, so given A, B, um, we say that A is B independent. If, uh, as you would expect, if A is not in the closure of A, throw away A, union B um, for all A and A. So there are sort of no closure relations between elements of A um, using also the set B. And uh, the rank of a over B um, is uh, the cardinality of a maximal um, B independent subset of A. And this last property, this exchange property, um, guarantees that any two such maximal sets will have the same cardinality. So this is well defined. Um, right, so I guess some sort of natural examples of this I'll get to. I mean, vector spaces are a natural example, um, algebraic closure. And then I guess the most basic example is just cardinality, but I'll sort of flesh those out. Um, first, I want to mention something about the history. I guess uh, Metroid theory was introduced in 1935 um, by Hassler Whitney. And uh, I guess its applications to projective geometry were discussed by uh, Saunders McLean in 1936. Uh, but its applications to model theory really began in 1971 with Baldwin and Lachlan's proof of Morley's theorem on uncountably categorical theories. Uh, Morley's theorem itself was uh, published in 1965, but his original proof didn't make any use of this. Um, I guess I should say Morley's theorem basically just states that if you have some sort of uh, theory in a countable language, and it only has one model of cardinality all of one, then it only has one model in any uncount of any uh, uncountable cardinality. Um, well, I was researching this. I found out that uh, actually the sort of idea that Baldwin and Lachlan use, um, which is basically to find a strongly minimal set around and then use that uh, the strongly minimal set gives rise to a, uh, a pre-geometry. Um, this was actually uh, started in a thesis by uh, William Marsh in 1966. And his thesis is only 12 pages. So this is like the shortest thesis I've ever seen. Um, but uh, I think it didn't really gain much traction until it was used in this uh, baldwin lachlan proof. And then after this, it sort of became like a pervasive theme in model theory. Um, I guess the, the subject of geometric model theory really involves studying these pre-geometries and how they control um, models, whether it's the number of models or how definable sets behave in these models or things like that. Um, right, so these things are one part of the equation. This gives us the dimension. But now we sort of need to talk about um, these uh, operators that we have around. So this is, uh, I guess, um, what Anton Giulio and I sort of add. But phi. be a tuple of maps if all of these maps commute um and we have this technical condition. Um, if whenever A is an element in the closure of some set B, then phi I applied to A is in the closure of phi one applied to B all the way up through, um, so maybe I'll write union, all the way up through phi I 
applied to B. Um, then phi is said to be a triangular system. Um, right, so I guess when I equals one, this just says that if A is in the closure of B, then phi one of A is in the closure of phi one of B. Um, but for I bigger than one, um, phi I of A is allowed to be in the closure of phi I of B, but also um, all of the sort of smaller things. So phi one of B, phi two of B, all the way up through phi I of B. So this is why it's called a triangular system because um, you're allowed to use sort of previous things um, when I is bigger than one. And then a subset A is a, said to be phi closed. If phi I of A is contained in A for all maps I. Um, Right, so just phi closed if it's uh, closed under each of these maps, phi one through phi m. And so our main theorem um, wait, one more thing I need. Um, natural number t and a subset of x um, I'll let phi t of a just be the set of um, So it's basically, I mean, same sort of thing as in this uh, differential fields case. You just apply all of these operators at most t, or ex exactly t many times in total to any element of A. So it's just a set which consists of all of these things. Um, and so our main theorem is uh, suppose phi is a triangular system. Um, let A be finite. And let B be phi closed. Um, then there is a polynomial P. Um, of degree less than M. Such that the rank of B, T, A over B equals P of T for sufficiently large T. Um, is everybody able to see this line or should I move it up a little bit? Okay. Hmm? Okay. Yeah, so I mean, it's sort of in the same spirit of all of these um, other results. And I guess maybe I should say that our proof of this is, uh, it's not super long. It's uh, fairly technical, I guess, fairly combinatorial. Um, basically, you just sort of like show that this uh, rank can be sort of split as a sum of uh, functions from n to the m to n. 
and that these functions are all decreasing, and then you just do a few calculations to get to this uh, result. Um, so now what I want to do is I want to uh, show how these uh, theorems can follow pretty quickly from this theorem. Uh, so maybe I'll start with the first one. Um, So uh, I'll just rewrite up here the conclusion. A plus TB is equal to P of T for T bigger than zero. So I guess the way that you know we need to prove all these results is we need to pick an appropriate finitary matroid and we need to pick an appropriate triangular system. So for this one, our finitary matroid um, is just going to be the semigroup S with a trivial closure. And what I mean by trivial closure is uh, closure of any set Y is just equal to that set Y. Um, and this tells you that the rank of Y is just equal to the cardinality of Y um, for any set Y. And then uh, I'll let B1 up through BM enumerate um, our finite set B, and for I equals one through M, let phi I of A just be A plus B I. So all of the maps just add, um, add the corresponding element B I and B. Um, So then if I apply all of these maps um, exactly t many times to our finite set A, this is just going to be the set A plus T B, right? Because I'm allowed to add, um, I guess, T different elements from B, or I guess T elements from B um, in total, right? Um, so to apply this theorem, really all I need to do is I need to check that uh, these maps form a triangular system. Uh, so of course, uh, we're assuming that the semigroup is commutative, so all these maps commute, that's no problem. Um, and then A is in the closure of B, this gives us that A plus B I, or maybe I'll say A is in the closure of some set C, just to not confuse it with the A and B already have. A plus B I is in the closure of, well, sorry, I should say A is in the closure of, we have trivial closure, so this just means that A is in, A is in C. This gives us that A plus B I is in C plus B I. And this is just saying that phi I of A is in the closure of phi I of C. And of course, being in the closure of phi I of C in particular means that you're in the closure of phi one through phi I of C, right? Because um, of that monotonicity thing. So if you're in the closure of some set, then you're in the closure of any superset of that set. Um, uh, So we already know that uh, phi t of a is a plus tb. And then the rank 
of phi t of a. We already said that rank is just the same as cardinality in this case. So it's the cardinality of a plus tb. Um, and then our theorem guarantees that that's equal to a polynomial, right? Um, right, so sorry, there's a bit of a notational confusion here. The phi close set B actually doesn't make an appearance in this proof. Um, the set B here, I'm sort of like enumerating as B1 through BM, and then each phi I corresponds to the sum um, where you add that element. So you could sort of, I guess, uh, maybe sharpen this result a little bit um, by considering the rank over some phi close set, call it C. And then all this would do is it would enumerate the elements in the sum set that aren't in C. So the size of the set minus C. Um, right. The proof of the second theorem is also, I think, pretty quick. Um, So just by sort of messing with the generators for M, we may assume that uh, the sort of positive part of M is generated by a finite set um, A contained in M0. Um, right, so you basically just sort of like re-index, so all of the generators are contained in some MT for T less than or equal to zero, and then you just multiply your generators by um, the XIs as much as you need to so that the bigger part is generated by um, the stuff bigger than or equal to zero is generated by the stuff in M0. Um, I'll let XCL be M with uh, my closure operator will be K linear span. So A is in the closure of a set B if A is in the uh, K linear span of B. Um, and then for i equals one through m, phi i of a is just um, is just uh, the scalar multiple x i times a. So. Uh, Pt of A, our set of generators, uh, generates Mt. Um, and then just like in the last one, now that we know this, we need to check that these Vi's form a triangular system. Of course, they all commute. And uh, just like in this last case, all of these uh, Vi's are basically just like uh, endomorphisms, right? So if A is in the closure of B, then xi times a is in the closure of xi times b. Um, so in particular, it's in the, the closure of x1 through xi times b. Um, and so the rank, this is just uh, the rank corresponding to k linear span is just k linear dimension. Um, and so since this thing generates mt, the k linear or the rank of this will be the same as the uh, k linear dimension of mt. And then again, you just apply the theorem um, to get that this is equal to a polynomial for a sufficiently large t. Um, of course, uh, um, here we're only assuming we're only sort of doing this for t bigger than zero, but like this, the theorem only asks that, so you can sort of forget about all the the lesser stuff. Um, right.
And then for this last thing, um, again, x um, is going to be equal to this time our field k with uh, algebraic closure. Um, and now we're going to have to sort of do a little bit of a, a trick. Um, here, uh, if I just take these delta 1 through delta m as my phi 1 through phi m, this will actually not form a triangular system. Um, but it's also sort of not exactly what I'm looking for, right? Because here I'm taking uh, r1 through, through rm to sum to something less than or equal to t, not something equal to t. So I can do this sort of trick. I can uh, let phi be phi 0, phi 1 up through phi m, where phi 0 is equal to the identity map just sends an element to itself, and phi i equals delta i. So I want to prove that this, uh, this bigger system is a triangular system. Of course, it's pretty clear that um, if a is in the closure of b, then phi 0 of a is in the closure of phi 0 of b, because phi 0 is just the identity map. That's pretty trivial. Um, but let's let i be greater than 0. Um, Let's say that A is in the uh, closure of B. Well, uh, what does it mean for A to be in the closure of B? Here, closure is algebraic closure. So this means that um, there's some polynomial P. Over the integers, and variables. So I'll take a tuple of variables x and then a single variable y. Um, and a tuple b from b with um, p of b a equals 0, and then the derivative of p with respect to the last variable non zero, right? Um, so then applying. delta i, we get that uh, delta i of p b a is equal to, uh, well, we'll just take the derivative of p with respect to x1 times the derivative of b up through the derivative of p with respect to x uh, let's say n times the derivative of bn. And here, so I should say derivative, the, uh, the i derivative, um, plus the derivative um, with respect to y times the derivative of a. And this is the derivative of something which is equal to 0, so it itself has to be equal to 0. But if you sort of look at what we have here, you can sort of view this whole expression is as a uh, as a polynomial where you allow parameters um, b, uh, the delta i applied to b, um, this element a, and then you have uh, this delta i a here. This whole thing is equal to zero. Of course, the partial derivative of this thing with respect to delta i of a is just uh, the derivative of p with respect to y of b a, which we've assumed to be non-zero. So, long story short. Um, delta i of a is in the algebraic closure. I was right, is in the closure of a along with uh, b. And we use these derivatives of things in b. Um, but a itself is in the closure of b. Um, so this is actually contained in the closure of uh, B and derivatives of things in B. Um, 
And then this, of course, is contained in the closure of, well, b is just phi zero applied to b. Um, I can add phi one up through phi i minus one applied to b without any harm. And then phi i applied to b was just a delta i times b. So this is indeed a triangular system. Um, and really, all I need is this zero with thing and the last thing. I don't need any of this stuff in the middle. Um, so once you have this, uh, I guess the, the result follows pretty easy. Um, Ft is really just um, F along with uh, Ft of our tuple A. Um, and the transcendence degree of Ft over F is just going to be the same thing as the rank of this thing over F, right? The rank corresponding to the closure operator of algebraic closure is just the usual um, transcendence degree. Right, so uh, I guess I'm almost out of time, so maybe I'll just sort of say a brief word about like, um, you know, these three examples are known, but um, a lot of the sort of new examples that we get from this result are inspired by model theory. So for example, instead of a field here, you could consider uh, an exponential field, which is a field with a maybe partially defined exponential on it, say the real field with exponentiation or the complex field with exponentiation. Um, and there's sort of a version of this for the p-adic numbers as well. Um, whenever you have an exponential field around, there's sort of a well-defined closure operator called exponential closure, which was defined by uh, McIntyre and shown to be a finitary matroid by uh, Kirby. Um, this exponential closure sort of generalizes algebraic closure. Um, and uh, what you can sort of do is you can take an exponential field, uh, you can take this exponential closure, you get a corresponding rank called exponential transcendence degree, and you can consider derivations on this field uh, called exponential derivations. And the only thing that you ask of an exponential derivation is that the derivative of x of some element is x of that element times the derivative of that element. And you can prove an analog of this uh, theorem of Colchin for these exponential fields. Um, and there's an even sort of more general analog of this that makes sense for O minimal fields, but um, I don't really wanna get into that. Um, another sort of way that this can be used is that um, these elements here, delta one through delta m, here I ask that they are derivations on k, but you could also just as well take them to be um, field endomorphisms of K. Uh, this gives rise to something called a differential difference field as opposed to just a differential field. Um, and you can sort of uh, consider the same sort of problem where here you're applying not just derivations, but derivations and difference operators to some element and seeing how the transcendence degree grows. Um, I guess Alexander Levin has done quite a bit of work on coming up with Colchin polynomials for these. And then our result is able to sort of give a, um, give sort of a, a general framework for this type of thing as well. Um, yeah, finally, I'll mention that uh, we have sort of a several variable analog for our main theorem. Um, I won't state the analog directly because it's a little bit tough to uh, um, write down, but I will say that you can sort of use it to generalize the uh, Kovansky subset argument to say that uh, given finite sets um, A, B1 through Bm, uh, you can say that the sum of A plus uh, S1, B1 all the way through Sm, Bm is a polynomial in S1 through Sm. And this is a generalization that was first proven by uh, Nathanson. So the, the multivariable version of this theorem also has some uh, uses. But of course, uh, um, we're very interested in finding sort of new uses for this sort of framework. There's a lot of uh, matroids that are studied in, uh, say, algebraic combinatorics, you know, involving things like tropical geometry 
or involving like uh, graphic matroids that uh, I'm not so familiar with, but uh, I think that it's maybe possible that this theorem could have some applications in counting sort of growth in that setting. All right, thank you. I'm happy to answer any questions, of course. Do you know what the um, I'm not entirely sure. Um, I mean, it's sort of uh, one of these fundamental results in additive combinatorics, but I'm not sort of sure if it was inspired by additive combinatorics or not. I know it's uh, it has some relation to, uh, I guess, convex polyhedra. Uh, there's a, a theorem of Earhart that um, if you look at sort of dilations of a convex polyhedra um, with, uh, say, rational endpoints or rational vertices, then this is given by a quasi-polynomial. And if you require to have integer vertices, then its size is eventually given by um, some polynomial, or I guess by its size, I should say, the number of integer points contained in it. Um, and uh, this is, I guess, of course, pretty closely related to all of this sort of stuff. You can sort of relate growth of polyhedra to uh, some sets and stuff like that. Uh, I'm not sure. Excuse me. Mm -hmm. We couldn't hear. We we couldn't hear the question. Uh, the question was, what is the uh, what is the sort of inspiration behind Kavansky proving his theorem on the growth of some sets? All right. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. um, right, I guess in all these cases, I never really check it because in all these, case, these cases, it's sort of assumed. But um, yeah, I mean, if you don't, if they don't commute, I mean, basically, I'm using that all of the sort of like uh, composites of phi, I can write down like this. I can just sort of write them as phi one to something, phi two to something. But in all of the proofs, I like sort of apply arbitrary phi i to various things. And I want to be able to sort of like uh, push the phi i through and sort of lump them in here. So if the phi's don't commute, then you wouldn't, I think, in general, expect any sort of polynomial growth. It would be like some sort of exponential growth, I guess. Maybe you could expect that it's, you know, in some cases equal to something sort of like a polynomial, but where the indeterminates don't commute and you just have like words and the indeterminates instead of the usual monomials. Right, so the proof is like, um, I guess you can consider given any function, F, you can consider, let's say, F going from n to the k, or sorry, n to the m to n, i equals one through m. You can consider the, uh, the operation delta i, which takes F to F of uh, t plus one minus F of t. Um, just the sort of normal, uh, I guess, differentiation kind of um, and you can prove that uh, if, when you apply this uh, m times to f, if you get something which is eventually equal to zero, then f itself has to be eventually equal to a polynomial of degree at most m minus one. So we just sort of like go in and calculate using this, uh, you know, things that we know about the closure and the assumption that we have a triangular system, that when you apply these things m times that you get, um, that you get a function which is eventually equal to zero. And by eventually, I guess I mean for uh, really, I guess the way I wrote this doesn't really make sense. It'd be, it'd be zeros, but a one in the ith place. And then, sorry. Zeros, one in the ith place, more zeros. Right, because it's a function of uh, m variables. Right, yeah. Um, by eventually being equal to zero, I just mean that from like, um, whenever all of your coordinates are sufficiently large, it's equal to zero. 
Elliot, can mm -hmm. everybody hear me? Is mm -hmm. this a uh, stronger condition than being uh, eventually a polynomial or this characterization? Um, no, I just... think it's a, uh, this should be equivalent. Yeah, proving that this is, I guess you, you can prove that like uh, all um, polynomials that take values in N would satisfy this condition pretty easily, I think. So yeah, this is equivalent to being eventually polynomial. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, so, does any of this apply to pre geometry coming from strongly minimal sets? Or? Um, this I don't know about. It would be interesting to find something you can say here. I guess. Um, as far as like applications and sort of pure model theory go, um, our plan, and we've done this in some cases, is to use this sort of Polchin polynomial thing to uh, bound the, uh, the Thorn rank or the U rank or the SU rank of certain types uh, by sort of like, especially in, in settings like um, say uh, differentially closed fields, um, differentially closed fields with the generic automorphism, um, some sort of O minimal analogs of these things. Um, and I guess in differentially closed fields, this is sort of like a pretty well known, but I guess uh, we have some new examples of where you can do this. Yeah. Okay, thanks everyone. Thank you very much.